Okay, I think it's time to get started. Let's Hi, go. everyone. <laughs> Welcome so much to today's webinar on music in the brain. My name is Margie, and I'll be your co-host for today. This is the first webinar in what we're calling our new Brain HQ Academy webinar series, and that will include um, additional webinars on a lot of other interesting topics in the future, so keep an eye out for those. Today, your main host will be Dr. Henry Monka, who is both a neuroscientist and our CEO. Uh, he'll lead us in a short group activity, followed by a slideshow on the science of music in the brain. Uh, then Dr. Michael Merzenich will join Henry for a conversation about his experience with music and about what you can do in your daily life um, to incorporate music in brain healthy ways. We'll finish up with a Q&A session and a short wrap up. Before we begin, there's just a few housekeeping items I'd like to point out. Uh, we'll be doing a short activity in this webinar that will use the chat feature on Zoom. If you'd like to test out your chat feature, just take your mouse and hover it near the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, click on the chat icon, and why don't you type in one of your favorite songs right now so that we can see what those are, uh, just to check it out. We will also be um, allowing questions, uh, of course. You can ask a question at any time by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And um, we probably won't get to all the questions today. There's quite a few people on this line, but we will endeavor to answer them in the follow-up week, um, those that we don't get to today. Uh, I think that's about it. So with that, Henry, please take it away. Super. Well, thank you so much, Margie, for kicking us off. And um, as Margie said, uh, we decided to start this new webinar series. And that's because, um, you know, everyone who's on the webinar today is a registered Brain HQ user. So all of you have done some brain training with us. But we find that, um, you know, every time I go out and give a talk, uh, people ask us questions about brain health that are beyond just brain training. Questions about sleep and physical exercise and nutrition and, well, even music. And people contact uh, us all the time and our wonderful customer delight team and ask them, um, hey, what else could I be doing or thinking about as part of my brain health program? So we started to start this webinar series to talk about the broader aspects of brain health that a person can think about or engage in beyond Brain HQ, which of course is at the center of any good brain health program. Uh, so uh, we're going to kick off with music in the brain and we're going to kick it off because music is uh, simply an astonishing and amazing aspect of what the brain can do. And uh, just to show us a little bit of that, we're going to start off with a game that amazingly we can all play together on this Zoom call today. We're going to play the world's largest game of Name That Tune. And uh, probably most of you know how this game works. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a tune. Uh, and then I'm going to pause it and we're going to ask everyone to name that tune. And the way you're going to do it is if you think you know what the song is, uh, open up that chat window like Marky just taught you about and type in the name of the tune when I pause it. So uh, we'll go through a couple rounds. Uh, some of them might be easy and some of them might be just a little bit harder. So everybody ready? Let's start off. So for our first one, we are going to, uh, well, I'll just drop it in and give everyone a listen. Here we go. All right, everyone, name that tune. That might sound familiar to you from back in the 60s when four mop tops uh, invaded the United States and the United Kingdom. So uh, type it into the chat window. If you know the name of that song, you know the name of what's gonna come next. Uh, I hope this is a familiar one to a lot of us. Margie, are we starting to get some answers in the chat window? Looks like a lot of people know this one. Eileen was first, very fast on the typing. Wow, good job, Eileen. Let's hear what they're going to next. Name that tune. Right, so that was the song that was all driving us all wild back in the 60s. So let's go on to a next one. This one might be a little bit harder. All right, now this one, we're gonna move into the 70s as you can recognize from those beautiful feathered haircuts and those big bell-bottom pants. This might've been your genre of music or it might not have been. If that one rings a bell, let us know what the name of that song is. What are they gonna sing next in this song? 
give everyone a chance to loosen up those typing fingers, give them a little workout. And uh, what are we starting to see, Margie? Do we start to see some answers here? Oh yeah, I don't think it was that hard after all. <laughs> Sean was first, and as I recall, Sean also was one of the first three in the last one, so. All right, a fast typer and a mm -hmm. fast brain. Let's see where this goes. What comes next? That's the PGs from the 70s. I'm delighted to know they're so popular. And you know, if you have an HBO subscription, there is a fantastic documentary on the Bee Gees on right now. I watched it because my wife is an enormous Bee Gees fan. And I learned a ton by watching it, but I'm glad uh, to know that it's so popular here as well. Now let's go to our next one. Let's see what we have here. Okay, so when Elvis is thinking of you, baby, what does he want you to do? Or maybe what does he want you not to do? We're digging a little bit more into the archives here, but I bet this is a pretty familiar tune to a, a lot of people everywhere in the world, and certainly those folks on the webinar today. Bust out those typing figures and tell us, what does Elvis want you not to do when he's thinking of you? Do well, we Norma was answers? the first to know, <laughs> um, and people mostly know that it's Elvis for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. He wants us to. Thank you, Elvis. That's good advice for everyone. And we're going to take one final step into the modern world now. And let's see what we have from the more recent years. Okay, so what is he going to do when he thinks past tomorrow? What is, or maybe in this case as well, like Elvis, what is he not going to do? Let's see if this rings a bell with anyone. This was obviously a Broadway smash. I bet it's familiar to a lot of our audience here. Margie, do we have a few people who are telling us what's going to happen next? A lot of people know it's from Hamilton and get really close to the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Laura might step. be the first one who got it right. All right, fantastic, Laura. Let's hear what is Alexander Hamilton gonna do when he stops thinking about tomorrow? He's going to. That's right, he's not throwing away his shot. And uh, uh, I'm glad we have some folks out there who know this. This is, uh, this is the musical that swept through my daughter's middle school like a firestorm and created more fans of American history among the seventh grade set than I think any American history teacher ever could have wanted. Uh, and, uh, and, and that really takes us to our topic today, which is it is simply incredible how powerful an experience music is on the brain. I bet many of you on this uh, webinar today uh, hadn't heard those songs in, I don't know, the last month, maybe the last six months. Maybe there were some songs you hadn't heard there in years. But as soon as you heard that melody, as soon as you heard that rhythm, as soon as you heard those words start, your brain actually created a prediction and figured out, hey, what is the name of the song? What is going to come next? And, and that's simply a remarkable ability. So to dive into it, let's talk about music and what it is and how it gets to the brain. Well, music starts off as a vibration in the air. And to show that, I'm gonna show this very cute video here, which actually has a person playing the guitar and a camera inside the guitar. Let's see what happens to those guitar strings when they play. So that's kind of a remarkable camera angle. And of course, what you see is that, uh, well, as you know, we uh, each note has a different frequency. And on a guitar, the lower notes are here at the top. And you can see in that vibration, they actually vibrate more slowly. And higher notes in a guitar are at the bottom and they vibrate more quickly. So music, of course, is a vibration in the air. And that vibration moves through the air and it reaches our ear. And when it reaches our ear, something remarkable also happens. The first part of our body that it really comes in contact with is called the cochlea. And the cochlea is this spiral shaped organ inside your ear. Actually, it looks like a snail just like this. 
And uh, the cochlea actually has all of these interesting hair cells on it. And a hair cell looks like this. You can see it in this picture. It's actually a little floppy hair that's attached right to the cochlea there. And what's interesting is that at the center of the spiral here, these hair cells are long and kind of floppy, kind of like that low note string on the guitar, which is also kind of floppy. And that means when those low notes hit the cochlea, these hair cells actually vibrate. But as you move outwards on the spiral towards the end of it, you start to see hair cells that look more like this. They're smaller and tighter. And they respond by when the uh, vibration is received, it's a high note on the guitar, just like those tight high strings on the guitar. And what that means is the entire cochlea is itself kind of like a musical instrument. It's laid out starting with low pitches and then moving all the way to high pitches, just the way a guitar does, or in this picture as is shown as a musical instrument with the low notes in green here at the center and the high notes shown in red and purple as we move outwards. Now that's kind of cool that the first part of your nervous system that music encounters is itself laid out like a musical instrument. Now, unfortunately, damage to the cochlea can cause profound deafness. If this is damaged or these hair cells are, are broken in some way, you can lose your hearing. But uh, Posit Science co-founder, Dr. Michael Mersnick, who will be joining us on the line in a little bit, uh, one of his many accomplishments in science was he actually helped invent uh, a medical device that uh, is a replacement cochlea and that can, can cure deafness. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Now, after sound gets processed in the cochlea, it's sent on to the brain, and the brain actually is also laid out like a musical instrument, and it starts in the auditory cortex. So this spiral shape looks familiar, I hope. It's the cochlea in the ear that we talked about, with low notes now shown in purple and high notes now shown in yellow. And when the co's hair cells in the cochlea are activated, they send electrical signals that get transmitted up into this part of the brain, kind of buried a little bit within it, called the auditory cortex. And it is also laid out like a musical instrument, like a piano, with the low notes uh, causing activation here in the front and higher notes causing activation here at the back of the, uh, of the auditory cortex. And scientists call this a map. It's a place in the brain where brain information processing, in this case, how we process frequencies and sounds, actually matches a feature of the real world. So it's laid out like a musical instrument or a piano. And I have to mention that uh, our friend, Dr. Mersnick was actually one of the first scientists to document this frequency map in the auditory cortex. So he's had a very busy career before he helped invent Brain HQ and found positive science. We'll talk about that a bit more as well. So uh, maybe we will... Um, pause there for just a moment, Margie, and, uh, and take a poll. I've talked a little bit about parts of the brain and how they're related to musical instruments. I think we have a poll to tell us a little bit about uh, what musical instruments people on our webinar today might play. Is that right? That's right. So I'm going to launch the poll now. Um, we were only allowed to include 10 items. So if you play a different instrument, feel free to put it in the chat again. We'd like to hear about it. And if you don't play a musical instrument at all, that's fine too. We're curious to hear about all of it. Yeah. Oh wow, this is fun to see it come in live like this. It is. Starting to come in here. We'll get and give it a minute because we're uh, having quite a few of these come in. Wow, all right. Some interesting answers here. I have to say, for those of you clicking on I play percussion, I appreciate that. My son is a jazz drummer and in college as we speak, although, of course, he's taking his drumming lessons via Zoom right now, but he's, uh, he's very committed to percussion. So I'm delighted to see some people out there who are also drummers or other kinds of percussion players. Okay, All so right, maybe I'll end the Paula. poll now. And we'll see if um, we can share the results with people. Uh, and so now you can see what the answers are. So. Most people either don't play one, they sing, play piano or guitar or something else. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, it's kind of interesting, Margaret, to see so many singers in the uh, in the audience. And singing is a wonderful form of musical training because, of course, it's something that just about anyone can do, at least some, on their own. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that can do for your brain. Great. So uh, let's uh, let's keep going and then say, well, okay, with all that singing and percussion and guitar playing, even a few harmonica players that I saw in the audience, you know, what part of the brain then gets activated by music? If we start off by acting that pure auditory cortex, uh, where does it go next? And um, so, you know, here are some parts of the brain kind of laid out in the standard picture. We have here in blue what's called the temporal cortex. That actually relates to hearing, as we saw, because the auditory cortex is in there, but it also relates to memory function. We have the frontal cortex that's involved in thinking and planning. We have the motor cortex that's involved in movement, an area called the somatosensory cortex that's actually involved in skin sensation. 
And then back here, the parietal cortex, which is involved in attention, and the visual cortex, which is involved in seeing. So we're not going to do a poll, but I want everyone to look at this and make a guess. When we're listening to music, which of these parts of the brain turns on in response to the music beyond just that little bit of auditory cortex? So with that thought in mind, I'm going to go on to show you a video that was actually put together by a group of scientists in Sweden that actually had people go in brain imaging systems and actually image their brains while they were listening to music to figure out, well, what part of the brain is activated by music? So I'm gonna start this and I'm immediately gonna jump ahead to, uh, to the 20 second interval here. So when we see this, what we're gonna see is uh, areas that are blue represent areas of uh, initial or light activation and then areas that turn yellow and red represent higher areas of higher activation. So let's see what we see in the brain here. All right, I'll pause there. So that music was playing while these people were in the magnet having their brain images. And really one of the first things we see is we see all this activation here in blue. And this represents the auditory cortex, which we just saw. And it makes sense that that's turning on as these people are listening to music. But let's skip ahead a little bit here and see what happens as the music goes on. So I'm gonna start at the 120 mark here and let's have a look. So I'll pause it there. We still see all this activation in the, uh, in the auditory cortex, but actually as we look at the brain, we see that music is activating almost the entire brain, right? Here's regions here up in the frontal cortex that are being activated in red. We see yellow and red all the way back here in these attention areas of the brain. We're even seeing some activation shown in blue in visual parts of the brain and even these motor coordinating areas. And that shows us that listening to music is a whole brain activity. While different parts of the brain do have different function, music turns on almost all of them in one way, shape or form. And that's probably one of the reasons music ends up being such a good activity for the brain. And so if we think back to these brain regions, well, what's going on? Well, when we see activation here at the temporal lobe, that probably relates to hearing the music and probably also to remembering the times you might've heard the music before or perhaps storing new music in memory. If we see this activation in the frontal cortex, it's probably about thinking about what the music means to you. If we see some activation in these motor regions or skin regions, well, maybe if you're a musician, you're actually imagining what it feels like to play this music. Of course, when we see activation in these attention areas, it's because we're directing our attention to the music. And finally, if we see activation in the visual cortex, it's probably because we're visualizing what the music looks like. Maybe we're musicians and we can see the score, or maybe we're just thinking about what it would be like to see someone play this music. So music activates the entire brain in that way. And that's one of the reasons it's so good for us. So let's talk more then about what effect music has on the brain as it's busy activating the whole brain. And to do that, we have to talk a little bit about what music is made up of. So music is made up of, first of all, rhythm. So here's a piece of music. Doesn't matter if you can't read the staff, it's okay. Music has a rhythm that's the timing of the notes. And if you can't read music, that's fine. I'll just clap this one out for you. It goes like this. So well, that's rhythm. The second part of music is of course melody and pitch. That's the frequency of the notes, which of course is shown by where they're laid on the musical staff here. Now, it might be hard to know what this song is just by looking at it. So I'll go ahead and tell you this song is happy birthday. It goes like this, happy birthday to, and I'll pause there. And I want you to think what comes next in this song. And I bet that just about everybody knows that what comes next in the song is you, happy, of course, then it goes on. So how is it that just hearing those first few notes and those first few words, happy birthday to, creates this incredibly strong sensation in our brain of what the next sound is gonna be, what the word is gonna be, what the frequency of the note is going to be, and even what the rhythm is gonna be. Well, when you first heard this song and you were just a few years old, you know, your brain didn't really have much ability to predict what was coming next. You hadn't heard the song very much. You hadn't learned it. But as you heard this song over and over again at birthday parties, and as you sung it, producing that music over and over again, and as you listened uh, to it over and over again, your brain actually rewired itself. It rewired itself to know that when it hears this rhythm and these pitches and these words, it's going to hear this note next. 
Now that rewiring, that ability to make that strong prediction of what's coming next is called brain plasticity. And of course, if you are here, part of the Brain HQ family, you probably know a bunch about brain plasticity. You know, what we mean by brain plasticity here as scientists is, well, it's fundamentally how the brain rewires itself through experience and learning. Um, the brain changes throughout its life. It changes when we're kids, it changes when we're young adults, it changes when we're older adults. In fact, the brain changes when we have healthy brains and the brain changes when our brains are not so healthy. It is fundamentally just how the brain works. And in particular, it's how the brain stores memory, making structural changes and functional changes and even chemical changes in the brain. Now, music has an incredibly powerful effect to drive brain plasticity. It turns out to change, to rewire itself, the brain needs two things, and music gives us both of them. The first is that, that the brain needs a reason to change. The brain only changes when it has to. If we're doing things that don't challenge our brain, the brain doesn't change. But if we're listening to music or we're training in music, our brains often need to get faster in order to hear the notes correctly or produce them correctly. Our brains often need to get more accurate so we can hear the fine distinction between different notes that might be very close together in frequency. But the second thing the brain needs is it needs the ability to change. Fundamentally, the brain only changes when it's allowed to change. So what lets the brain change? Well, let's go back to a slightly different picture of the brain here. And what all of these colored lines are is they represent different parts of the brain that are located here at the bottom near the brain stem. And these are different neuromodulatory systems that actually control the ability of the brain to change. Now, one of the first ones that's incredibly important is the attention system. Now, when you pay attention to something, your brain actually releases a chemical called acetylcholine, and that enables your brain to change. And you might know this, right? If you think back to school and you remember in math class, maybe you were staring out the window and you weren't paying attention to the teacher, your brain probably didn't rewire itself to become super good at math. Maybe the person next to you who was paying attention to the teacher released that acetylcholine during math class, and their brain changed to get better at math. The same thing is true for novelty. New things have to happen for our brain to change. That involves a neurochemical called uh, noradrenaline. And finally, our brains have to be rewarded to change. It has to feel good when we are learning something or getting better at it. We have to get positive feedback. Well, of course, music gives us all of these. If we're listening to music or we're learning how to play music, we're paying attention very carefully. We're often uh, hearing new kinds of music or doing new kinds of things. And finally, of course, it's rewarding. It's fun. It feels good to hear new music and, and learn new things. All of those things turn on brain plasticity, which helps music rewire the brain. And in fact, music training can rewire the brain enormously. What we're looking at here are uh, images of the brain and they're color coded to show us the areas of the brain in musicians that are most different from the areas of the brain in, uh, in, in people who are not musicians. And what many, many studies have now shown is that musicians have very different brains. They have increased what's called gray matter. That means more uh, nerves, more neuronal cells in the auditory cortex for listening in the motor cortex for making movements. In fact, that's what we're seeing here. These two big red areas on the top of the brain probably relate to the motor training, the movement training that musicians have to engage in. Scientists also have seen increased symmetry between the left and the right hemisphere of the brain uh, and actually thicker connections between the left and the right hemispheres, probably because musicians have to use both sides of their body, both hands in coordination. And scientists have even seen that there's thicker white matter, which is insulation in the connections between the brain that reach down into the body and the spinal cord, again, probably related to um, training movement in musicians. And the earlier people start those music lessons, the more their brain changes. So this is a wonderful set of experiments that were done that looked at adults, but it classified them into adults who had no music training shown in black, adults who had one to five years of music training shown in blue, and adults who had six to 11 years of training shown in red. And what these researchers looked at was how accurately and how quickly did the brain process rapidly changing sounds. And as you might imagine, that's a core part of musical training. And what we see is that adults who had the most music training as kids, even though we're measuring them as adults, have the highest uh, signal to noise ratio, the highest ability to change these rapidly uh, changing sounds. So the more music training a kid gets, the better off their brain is. And in fact, one wild phenomenon about that is uh, many people have probably heard of this phenomenon of perfect pitch, where a musician, um, a trained musician, can simply identify a single note that's played on a piano as being an A or an F sharp or what have you. Now, not all musicians can do that, only a subset of them. And scientists have looked at the brains of musicians who have perfect pitch compared to trained musicians, still wonderful musicians who have ordinary pitch. 
And what they have found is that in the brains of those musicians with perfect pitch, much more of the brain is devoted to auditory processing than even musicians with regular pitch. And that's led to the question, why, you know, where does that come from? And of course, it comes from brain plasticity in childhood. It comes from being raised in a very musical environment and practicing an instrument a lot. And in fact, many people now ask the question, you know, it's not why do some people have perfect pitch, but why don't we all have perfect pitch? You know, everyone on this call probably has perfect pitch for colors. If I were to show you a color, you could name it. Uh, you probably have perfect pitch for faces. You probably remember the names of hundreds of people, sorry, remember the faces of hundreds of people that you've met over the years. And maybe if all of us were raised with a lot of exposure to music and a lot of practice, we'd all have perfect pitch as well. So that's kids. What happens uh, with older adults in music? Well, to answer that question, we have to start with the question of, uh, hey, what happens to our brains in general as we get older? And as we get older, our brains get noisy, in fact, and they get a little bit out of tune. This is data from, uh, from experiments done with rats, actually, uh, in uh, Dr. Mersnick's lab. And uh, here's a young rat, you can see she's very perky and excited. And this is actually a map of the auditory cortex of her brain. And what we're showing here in color is, well, how precise uh, is, uh, is the auditory cortex. Each of these colors, if they're blue, shows us an area of the brain that's very precise and very accurate. And if it's red or orange, it's an area of the brain that's kind of noisy, doesn't respond very quickly and accurately. And as rats get older, here's an old rat. You can see that you know she's looking a little older than her young colleague here. Now you can see that her brain is mostly red and orange. Lots of her auditory cortex is kind of noisy. It doesn't respond as quickly and accurately to sounds in a younger rat. And that happens in people as well. That's why often as we get older, it's harder to hear in a noisy restaurant or why it might be hard to follow a kid who's talking quickly. And it turns out that noise has an effect on us. Noisy brains have somewhat worse cognitive function. Uh, you know, what we're looking at here is the number of uh, words a person can remember after they've read a list of 10 words. And on the average, a young person can remember maybe eight, eight and a half. But if you read those list of words in a noisy environment, actually a young person's memory gets worse. Now they can remember only about six words. So noise lowers cognitive performance. And that's probably what's going on with older brains as well. If we look at older people who maybe on the average can remember seven and a half words, that's probably because inside of their brains, like we see in that rat, more of the brain is kind of red and orange. It's kind of noisy. Now, what can we do to help with that? Well, the first thing is actually listening to music in many situations can help cognitive function. Although in some situations, it's actually not so good for cognitive function. So what do I mean by that? Well, scientists have the idea of cognitive load. This means how much is the brain doing right now? How much burden is all of the thinking that we're doing weighing on our brain? And you might think of it as at low cognitive loads, your brain's not busy and it's very distractible. And there's kind of a sweet spot where your brain is optimally busy, so you give the best cognitive performance. But above that, your brain's a bit overloaded and maybe you don't do so well anymore. So what happens if we have a simple cognitive task, maybe something a psychologist asks us to do, remember some words, or maybe we're working at home and we just have to you know, do a lot of data entry on a computer or something like that. Well, let's add some music in. So as we add that music in, <laughs> as we add that music in, uh, you know, that simple task moves up to being in the sweet spot. And that's why music actually can help us focus and get certain things done. But if we're doing a more complex cognitive task, and an interesting study was done with surgeons learning a new procedure, that same music can be distracting. And it can move that task to an overloaded case. And now their brains don't work as well. And in fact, um, their brain is overloaded. They don't learn the task as well. So what science has shown us is that music in a major key that's kind of up-tempo and has a good pace to it, you know, can help take simple tasks and make us somewhat better at them. But how about musical training? Well, it turns out that training can improve cognitive function pretty beautifully. There's been a lot of studies now done showing that training uh, adults and older adults can be a brain health intervention. One quite beautiful study compared music training where uh, twice per week for one hour a day, people did uh, two kinds of music training. They either did singing uh, and they did drumming as well, like playing on the bongo drums. And what was shown in this study, and they compared that to a group that did physical exercise. And what they found was that the musical training showed significantly greater benefits to overall cognitive function than the, um, than the physical exercise, probably because it was engaging the brain so strongly. 
And uh, you don't really have to be Tony Bennett or uh, Jack Costanzo, the uh, drummer here, to experience these benefits. These are things that all of us can do to improve our brain function. Now, it turns out that Brain HQ, which everyone here has, has had a taste of at least, like musical training, trains the brain to be fast and accurate. So uh, here's a piece of music written by Taylor Swift. You might know her. She's a country sort of pop artist now. And, and I have to say she had the world's most productive um, uh, quarantine period. While most of us were watching Netflix and worrying about the pandemic, uh, Taylor Swift actually recorded an album that won the Grammy for the best album of the year. Uh, so here's a little song from her. It goes like this. I knew you were trouble when you walked in, except I'm singing it much more slowly than she does. So when she sings this song or when you listen to it, if you want to keep up with the pace of these notes, you're going to have to have a brain that can move pretty quickly. And it's going to have to move, uh, if you've done the Brain HQ exercise auditory sweeps, about as fast as this. So if you can do that auditory sweep in Brain HQ, if you can hear the first one goes up and the second one goes down, then you're going fast enough to keep up with the first part of this song. But then when she doubles the speed here, your brain's going to have to go faster. You're going to be have to hearing the auditory sweeps in Brain HQ like this. Oops. Let's hear that one more time. So much faster at around 150 milliseconds. So that's the way that Brain HQ training is kind of like a distilled version of music training by making the brain faster and accurate. Uh, it's having the same effects that music training does, except maybe uh, at a sort of accelerated dose. And in fact, that's what studies have shown. If we go back to our rats here, if we add a new rat here, this is a rat who's been through Brain HQ training for rat. And we look at the organization of her auditory cortex, we see that even though she's as old as this rat, almost all of her brain is now shown in these blue and yellow areas. That means her brain has become sharp and precise again as a result of this Brain HQ musical training. And in fact, that ends up having tremendous benefits. So studies using these auditory exercises in Brain HQ have shown that they rewire the brain, they sharpen cognitive function, and they improve everyday life. So by rewiring the brain, what I mean is that these Brain HQ auditory exercises, again, kind of based on the principles of music training, you know, they strengthen wiring between different brain regions, and they actually improve the activation of memory centers in the brain. And when scientists look at that effect on cognitive function, they see that rewiring the brain sharpens cognitive function by strengthening memory, attention, and speed, particularly with auditory tasks. And this ends up having great benefits in everyday life. Uh, people who've done these exercises improve their hearing in noisy environments. And in fact, the changes are significant enough that people report noticing them in their everyday life on standardized measures and clinical trials. So I'm gonna pause there from kind of my science talk and, um, we're gonna talk about probably the most exciting part now, which is, hey, how do we put this to work in real life? If music training, Brain HQ auditory training can rewire our brains like this, well, what are things that all of us can do to rewire our brains? And I'm gonna invite my, uh, my friend, my colleague, my mentor, Dr. Michael Merzdek to join me. Mike, can we have you join on the camera? Oh, there we go. Oh, there hey, you Mike. are. Oh, that's, that's discouraging. <laughs> You're back. I see you, I hear you in full color. How all are you right. doing today? I'm doing great. <laughs> nice to be with the audience and with you, Henry, as uh, always. I'm delighted to have you, and it's nice to see you, even if we're just seeing you by Zoom. Yeah, so, I'm here in the countryside. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice place to be. So, um, so uh, yeah, let's dive in, Mike. Um, you know, uh, I should... Uh, introduce you briefly, right? Of course, you're a world famous scientist. You uh, helped invent the cochlear implant, which cured deafness. You helped discover that the brain was organized like a musical instrument. And then you went on to discover the basic principles of brain plasticity that led to Brain HQ. So um, uh, quite, quite, a, quite a time that you've spent on this earth so far and a lot more ahead of us. That was a bit of an inflated uh, statement, Henry, but we'll accept it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please that you'll take it. So, uh, you know, uh, you're really well known, of course, for your work in brain plasticity, Mike, but a lot of people may have only heard today that you're equally well known for your work on the basic science of the auditory system. And, yeah. you know, I wonder, uh, you know, what originally drew you to your work on the auditory system? How'd you get started? What made that interesting to you? Well, I was interested in, in the brain, of course, but I was interested in human, human, our humanity, and I was interested in human operations in the brain. I wanted to study the physical brain because I thought that's where we could understand our, our, the basis of our human natures. And music and, 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 and language represented a very special entree into that science because, first of all, there's a rich literature in the psych, psychology side 
and understanding of what music means to us, what language about in language operations in the domain of linguistics. And then music uh, appreciation, making music, as with language, is a pretty specific and wonderful human attribute, a human asset that we have. It's very special to we humans. We make music. We really enjoy yeah. listening to music. Oh, music is a part of our life, just like language is a very precious and special part of our life that differentiates us from other mammals, from other animals. And wow. I was really interested in that. Oh, that makes sense. A lot of, I think, people like yourself come into neuroscience because they want to understand the human brain and what makes us so unique. And I guess the auditory system is a real window into that. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, in that work, you know, as I mentioned briefly, uh, you know, you led a team that invented the cochlear implant, which uh, is that medical device that can restore hearing to people, children and adults, many of whom have been deaf for a long period of time, in some cases their whole life. I wonder, did you ever work with a patient like that where uh, when their hearing was restored, they got to hear music again, or maybe for the first time? What was that like for them? Well, that's a great question, Henry. And some people do, you know, that are less experienced in music, you know, music sounds to them still artificial, uh, commonly described as sounding something like a uh, not very well tuned accordion or just not quite right. But someone that's really experienced in music. So I, 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 I've had interactions with several people that were professional musicians before they got their cochlear implant and they recovered a remarkable ability. So one person that I talked to a lot had been a professional guitarist and he went right back and played his guitar and said he, he appreciated it sounded like he, he, op he operated on his guitar as he did before he'd lost his hearing. Huh. Uh, I had a wonderful correspondence for a period of time as another example with an organist from Great Britain who wow. talked about how she had recovered her ability to appreciate and make music and how she thought she had re substantially recovered her skills that she had as a professional before she lost her hearing. So, so uh, that's a remarkable achievement of brain plasticity that in, when you deliver information and in, in, in not quite in the same way that's delivered <laughs> in the brain with an artificial device like cochlear implant, that you can reconstruct, the brain can reconstruct, can make sense of speech, can make sense of music. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a miracle of plasticity, really. So that musical training in those two cases, uh, you know, that had rewired their brains. And then even when they lost their hearing, their brain was still wired that way. So when they got a cochlear yeah. implant, they were able to hear and process music again. But how about kids? How about a, a child who may be unfortunately born deaf and then receives a cochlear right. implant? What, do you, what is it like for them to hear music for the first time? Do they get it right off oh, the bat or do they have it, to it, learn how to hear it almost? The word for it is thrilling. You know, they're thrilled by it. It's just amazing to them, it's remarkable. Of course, they still have to go through the progression of the acquisition of understanding and learning about it. But, but they seem to learn about it, seem to acquire musical ability and, and the elaboration of the understanding and the meanings of it, the emotional, uh, you know, in a remarkably normal way. That's incredible. Uh, it shows how powerful that is for us. So, yeah. um, well, how about neuroscientists, right? You've been a neuroscientist since uh, pretty much having helped invent the field. And you know just about every uh, renowned neuroscientist in the field. Are, are there any neuroscientists who are musicians or are science and music like oil and water? They just don't mix. Well, it's, it's, I would say it's unusual. I mean, I was a, I was a musician as a lad, like, huh. like, a lot of, like, like a lot of scientists and other folk are. Uh, huh. I actually thought about being a, a professional musician as a boy until I found out that there were other people that probably had more talent and gumption in playing, making music than I did. Okay, but tell us, we want to know, what did the young Mike Mersnick play when he was growing and up? I played the saxophone, okay? I had a tenor and alto saxophone and I did my best. <laughs> but but uh, I have known a couple of musicians, uh, uh, scientists that were really exceptional. I, I had a friend who was a professor, professor at Louisiana State Medical School and in, 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 uh, in, in operating out of uh, New Orleans. And he was a jazz musician of great talent. And in fact, oh. I love to visit him in New Orleans because the, when he'd go down to Bourbon Street or some other place, the, <laughs> the musicians would invite him to come up and join them. And uh, he'd go up and they, they all knew him. And he'd go up and he'd, uh, he'd join their combo, their, their jazz band <laughs> and make music, you know? <laughs> so there are instances of people that have crossed that line <laughs> and uh, are multi-talented that way. Uh, I wish I was more on that path. Wow. Well, but maybe on that path, I mean, how about you? You're not a saxophonist anymore, but what kind of music do you enjoy? And has there oh, ever I, been a time where your love of music and your love of science did have the opportunity to connect? Well, I still love to sing and I, and I, and I, and I love music in general. 
And, and uh, I think there's nothing greater than a group thing. You know, it's just, it's just a wonderful community thing. And, and, uh, but I, I love, you know, symphonic music. I love the ballet. Ballet is a special. I love to watch people move in beautiful, graceful, fluid, fluid ways when I'm listening to the music that, and, they're, and they're, in a sense, they're dancing, they're swaying, they're right. moving through the music. It really brings it all together. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's and I, it's a, it's a thrill for me. And San Francisco has a wonderful symphony, has a wonderful ballet. We're but then I like country music. I got to say, I like folk music. I like, uh, I like the old classics, you know, I like music. <laughs> And uh, have you ever had an experience where you're listening to music where that's connected in science with you in some way? Yeah, that's really interesting, Henry, because I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that adds a little cognitive load. <laughs> and <laughs> you and smarter, go through it? my head. You know, I've had some of my very best, I, you know, sort of integrated ideas, you know, the breakthrough, the aha moments, uh -huh. sitting in the ballet. And it's yeah. a combination of listening to that commonly beautiful melodic mu music and watching human, graceful human mo movement. And somehow the great ideas just come out of nowhere and integrate. <laughs> and, and there's something I've been thinking about a long time. And uh, you know, at the interval, I, I, I say to, to my wife, Diane, ah, ah, you know, I have no one to tell it to. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, but you that should, happened you to me more often enough so that I know that being in that mode Yep. You know, it, it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful ab abstracting mode for your for your thinking brain. No, I'm glad to hear you didn't jump up and shout aha in the middle of the performance. <laughs> That's right. Have, well, it came might have not uh, so um, so you know, with all these great benefits from music that we've heard about today, you know, what are some ways that you can suggest that people can engage in music and, and help their brain health? What are things that we can all do in our lives right now? Well, first of all, as a listener, uh, and if you enjoy music, and I would guess that most people that have that are that are that are listening to this now are 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 music fans, be an accurate listener. You know, like anything else, if you really listen, if you listen to the nuances, the feeling, the you know, grow your listening skill, grow your attentional control of music. And you know, if you listen to symphonic music or some any kind of complex music, it could be rock and roll. I don't care. But listen to the details. Try to pick out what the bass guitarist is doing. Uh -huh. and try to pick out what the elbow is up to, you know? I mean, I love to sit behind the symphony in San Francisco where you can do this in the symphony orchestra and associate what everybody is doing with the sound that's being made in detail. I just love that experience. So engaging your attention and really focusing in those that's different parts thing. of the music. And and make, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're inspired to, make music. Use uh -huh. that voice, you know? Yeah. Put your hands on some instrument. Now, you're, now think of what you're doing. You're, you're re if you're reading a score, you're, you've got your vision, you're, you're, it's, you're, you're, you're controlling your actions in, in complicated ways precisely in time, precisely in time. And that's really important because the brain wants you to be precise in time. Temporal precision is called progress in your brain. And then you're, you're, you're calibrating everything, the accuracy of what you're doing and listening. And there's an emotional override to it. You know, it's, it's a fabulous way to engage your brain in these multiple dimensions of vision, movement control, action control, and accurate listening. And all of those things are integrated. I mean, you are really engaging your brain to change in a, in a very broad and complicated way by playing in music. Okay. And a lot of those benefits generalize to other performance abilities in your brain. So you heard it here first, Bucks. Uh, Mike Mersnick encourages you to sing on the shower, sing along on the radio in your <laughs> car. All right. those places making music is helpful for yeah. you. All right, one last question from me, Mike, and then we'll take some questions from uh, from everyone who's joined us today. Right. Um, so we talked a bit about Brain HQ training and how the auditory training exercises in Brain HQ help tune up the brain in the same right. way that musical training does. Right. You know, how do you think uh, Brain HQ training and auditory training can uh, can help people with their appreciation and their love of music? Are those? Yeah, things it's really happen? interesting because when you when you play the Brain HQ exercises, you might not instinctively understand. Yet you're training the elemental neurological skills and abilities to support accurate or effective music uh, listening and that support that, that would really support accurate music production. Uh -huh. but, but it does. It's really designed to change the general abilities to improve the general neurological mach mach machinery of the brain that supports all of these things. So it's an enabling thing. It's, okay. you know, your brain is probably, if you haven't been, 
engage in these activities on a significant scale, your, your brain is probably operating pretty sloppily, you know, not very precisely in its control of information and time and in frequency or in time and in place. And so now what you're point. doing is refining that general ability. And, and now you have the precise ability that enables you to take on music or anything else like it, anything that's really important to you, you're empowered to do because your brain is healthy again. It's organically functional again. I talked to a friend of mine here at Positive Science who told me he'd spoken to a woman who was in her church choir. And yeah. what she found was that as a result of doing Brain HQ training, she felt like she could read the music more quickly and accurately. Yeah. She right. felt like so she that's was better common... able to get in sync and yeah. kind of the timing with the people she was singing with. That's a common kind of report that, that, that suddenly you're, you're in it, not just enabled, but you're confident because you know, you, 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 you understand that your skills are up to the game. And that, that's really, really, really a valuable thing. Having a sharp, fast, healthy brain helps us in so many ways. There's another uh, thing about so, this story that I just want to say oh, before okay. we move on to other questions. You, one of the fabulous things about music, and you made a point of emphasis in what you said earlier, is that it grows our power of progressive prediction. Yes. And, and, and progressive prediction is a fabulous thing because it is, in a sense, the, the, the engine that drives our stream of consciousness. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental part of our aliveness. You want to exercise it, right? And music yep. basically is rich in that, like language itself is rich in that. They're both loaded with, with uh, you could say, exercise, loaded exercises for making forward prediction or for generating the fluent movements forward in your brain that take you somewhere. And that's probably why we feel so alive, so conscious, and so uniquely human when we're listening to music. We do, absolutely. All right. Well, hey, let's uh, let's have Margie join us again. And uh, I know we've had some questions by email, and it looks like we have some questions here. Like you said, we're not going to be able to hit them all live, although we'll hit a few of them, and we'll catch up by the rest of them by email. But um, what, are you, uh, what are people asking about, Margie? First, I think we should take a moment. We've heard that Mike really enjoys classical music, and we have a poll to see what kind of genres people in our audience like. So let's take 30 seconds to check that out, shall we? Let's do it. I'm dying to know. Okay. I'll say as people answer the uh, poll that I mentioned my son is a jazz drummer, but he started off as a heavy metal drummer. So I had the opportunity to really expand my musical genre experience by going to a lot of heavy metal concerts with him in high school. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's loud, not so good for the hearing, but I think any kind of good music does the brain good. I really enjoyed it. All right. Well, the answers are coming in. It looks like our audience is big on classical and jazz, not uh, quite uh, so big on hip hop. <laughs> I'm glad we have a few hip hop enthusiasts out there, though. We Thank do you. have a few. Yeah. OK, so I'll just end that poll now um, and uh, share the results with people. Classical yeah. one, hands down. <laughs> but we have broad tastes across the, across the spectrum taste. here, I would we say. Sure do. Okay, well, let's move on to the questions now. We have gotten a lot. Um, before we start, uh, as Henry said, we're not gonna be able to answer all of them, but we should be able to get to quite a few. Um, if we don't get to answer your question today, if you could um, email them to support at brainhq.com, we'll be sure to, me and Mike will get together and we will be sure to try and figure out an answer for you. Uh, and yeah, so let's see, what questions do I have for you today? I wrote them in a doc and now here it is. Okay, Boris asks, why do I remember melodies much better than words or names? Oh, that's a great question, Forrest. Uh, basically, in a melody, again, you have strong forward prediction, and and you have so you have a continual reference for the for the for what comes next. So you 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 actually are creating the memory like an episodic memory. You remember the events that occur in sequence, and and that's a powerful. You have a powerful set of ongoing clues that 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 are that are controlling your operations, and you're also commonly strongly uh, cross referencing that memory. With other things that you associate with that particular melody or with that particular, so you're, you've livened your brain. You really have your your brain basically is amped up because of those um, that emotional override that associates that associates that that music. So this complex set of effects are powerfully enabling for re re reconstructing that. Now, whereas you try to think of a person's name, you know, for the seeing that person sort of at random, and there you don't have that contextual information until you drum it up 
you know, basically by talking to you or them or by, uh, by interacting with them or trying desperately to remember where you saw them before. Well, it's almost like with music, you hear the first bit and your brain starts to roll along in a groove that's like well-learned right. and well-rehearsed. And so right. the next piece comes almost automatically to you. But if yeah. you just see a face, like you're saying, there's not much context around it. Your brain has to work much harder to figure out, hey, where do I know that person from? Exactly, exactly. Super, great question. What else we got, Margie? We have a bunch of questions kind of in a theme. Um, so I will read a couple of them. Adelaida asks, why is music so intertwined to the spirit? And Barbara okay. asks, can you explain what happens or why we get so emotional from music? Yeah. Um, and what is the kind of underlying emotional impact of music? Well, that's a wonderful, those are wonderful questions. And that's a very special quality of it. Well, one of the reasons is that we associate music, of course, with celebration. We associate with things that are rewarding to us in our lives. We associate music with romance. We associate things with all kinds of things that are, that are, that are, that are to us spiritual. You know, in a sense, we, when we're out in nature, we, we hear the music of the spheres in a sense. I mean, we associate sound with things that we love and those, love, those, those things are rewarding to the brain. Basically, they're reinforcing. And, and the, the other thing that's really important about it is the music is actually predominantly represented in the right side of our brain. And in listening, the right side of our brain in the listening domain, the left side is associated with language interpretation, with the, with, with the sounds of language, with speech. The, 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 the right side is associated with emotion and the emotion of speech. When the right side, the modulation of emotion from listening are, are, are where it's at. And this is where we primarily are representing music. We're actually wiring it into the part of our brain in listening that's associated with our emotions, with our feelings. So it grabs us and it grabs us in the combination of this, you know, historic reference with the music being a source of a joyful time for us and music being basically represented in the part of our brain that, that is contributing to our emotional feelings and good feelings. Uh, and like you said, there's so much of music that is uh, carrying us from one moment to the next because of the rhythm and the melody. And, um, yeah. and of course, as you were mentioning, that's probably deeply related to our conscious experience yeah. of moving from one moment to the next. So it hits well, us. Yeah. Exactly and way. I don't know about you, Henry, but I still uh, remember in, in uh, the, uh, the music that I, uh, that I, uh, that I heard when I, the, the theme from Summer Place when I first met my wife and had a dance with her many years ago. And I can, I, uh, I can play it in my mind as I think about it because then associated emotionally exactly. with all of the wonderful, you know, things that are associated with that, with what came from that. Yep, a beautiful moment. Margie. Yeah, well, another um, person, Alex, asks about, you know, music can also, uh, music that you haven't been exposed to previously can also associate um, be associated with memories, even things oh. like sadness, nostalgia, happiness, anger, anxiety. So music can do these things even if you haven't right. heard that piece of music right. before. So how's right. that happening? Well, it, you, you know, you have a complex, Alex, you have a complex music history. And from that listening history, you know, you have all kinds of associations that you're drawing to it that from that music. And, and you know, it, 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 and there are other aspects of it that also are stimulating you that are turning up the lights in your brain, just the novelty of it, just the surprises of it. You know, you hear a new song and there's a turn of the lyric or there's a change in the sound that's particular intriguing or engaging. The novelty of it basically turns on the lights in your brain. And, and so the combination of the fact that it, from your music history, you have an incredibly complicated reference base. You don't think about it, but you have a encyclopedic record of information about the music that you've received or heard in your life that have related to your life, that had meaning in your life. And now you hear new music and you're drawing a new relationship with that complex reference information. And it means something to you because of that reference base. So, you know, it's another way of saying that it's a healthy thing in life to richly load your encyclopedic information in all of the domains, not just music, but in all your domains, as much as you can, so that you have a powerful reference base that can always carry you back to make life meaningful, to make every little moment of your life meaningful, and certainly every little moment 
in which you're listening to music or new music. Great. Well, Brian asks, what about dancing in music? Oh, that's great. That Brian, that, 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 now here's another area where controlling your action in relation to music and, can, in, in, and you can say confirming it by how much your wife or your partner kicks you. Uh, uh, it's been demonstrated to be really good for your brain. Progressively engaging yourself in, 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 you could say, music controlled movement is a very wonderful thing to do. Just like controlling your actions by monitoring the production of music on an instrument is a very good thing. And here you're engaging the brain more holistically. You're listening, you're, you're in action, you're confer you're, you, have, you have complex sequential movement control as you have complex sequential listening, all linked together and all associated with another person moving with you. If you're in a partner dancing situation, that's a pretty, pretty sophisticated way to engage your brain to improve your operations. All right, we have a couple of questions here about are some better than others? So Barbara asks, you know, is singing better than percussion or melody instruments or harmony instruments? Or others no. ask, are certain types of genres of music better to listen to? Well, that's like asking if you like cake more, more, better than pie. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's a, uh, they're good questions, but, but, uh, and, and, uh, I think, you know, singing is one, I, I think the critical thing is that it matters to you. Yeah. That it's, that it's progressively, that you think about it as something in which you're progressively going to improve at. Don't just say I'm been good enough. You know, I can really, I can still carry a tune, you know, uh, if you, if you want to, you know, Karaoke is good, but, but here's what I would say about it. The next time you're up there and you're going to sing a song, try to be a little better. You know, in other words, if you don't take it just a little bit seriously, then the brain doesn't care. It's not going to improve, not going to change. Whatever you do, do what's something that will matter to you because the brain is very concerned about it mattering to you. That's when it changes. That's when it changes the most is when it matters to the brain. And when it matters to you, when it matters to the brain, then, then things will change for the better. And it doesn't matter whether you play the harmonica, whether you play the piano, whether you, whether you sing, uh, whether, you, whether, you, whether you play the bongo drums, it doesn't matter. As long as it matters to you, it'll all drive improvement. I would say, if you have the ability to carry it to, if you're gonna make music, if you carry it to a score as a singer, or as a, as a, well, because now you're adding the visual dimension, you're adding your visual domain to, 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 to helping you control action that's confirmed by listening. And this combination of things, this is a whole brain activity. It's a wonderful kind of thing to do for your brain. Okay. That's great to hear because then people can pick what they like and they're going to get some benefit out of it as long as they work and they do some uh, hard right. work at it. We're just coming up on the hour. And so I think we'll stop our Q&A here. But again, please email us at support at brainhq.com with any additional questions you have. Um, Mike and I will get together and try to answer as many of them as we can in the next few days. Uh, so uh, we can get your answers to you. Um, just a few little wrap up items. Thanks again for participating. We really appreciate you being here today. Um, check your email tomorrow. We're gonna have some follow-up stuff for you, some book and movie recommendations, a quick survey to see how you thought this webinar went so we can improve in the future and so forth. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for information on the next uh, webinar in the series. And Henry, do you have any last words or Mike? Yeah, you know, the last thought I'll offer, first of all, thanks to you and Mike for uh, joining us today. And thanks to you, Stephanie, you're behind the scenes here and no one has seen you, but you've made this go flawlessly. And uh, hey, everyone, when you finish this webinar, uh, hi, Stephanie, uh, I want you later on today, maybe right now or maybe right before dinner, to take a few minutes and go to Brain HQ. You can log on at your website at brainhq.com. And I want you to log in and I want to try, I want you to try some of the auditory exercises. You can just go directly, for example, to the sound sweeps, the auditory sweeps exercise and give that a try uh, or pick some of the other auditory exercises that you may have tried before. And I want you to work at it today. And as you're doing that, I want you to think about what's happening in your brain based on what we've talked
talk today and how having that sharper, faster brain that Brain HQ is going to give you can help you uh, enjoy listening to music, enjoy making music, and go out into the world and do so many other brain health activities. So take this as a chance today to have learned something about the brain and then put it into action with Brain HQ. Yeah, I, right, I'd like to reinforce that and just say that uh, as you d d use brain HQ exercise, remember that you're trying to change that you're trying to improve the general ability to refine, you're trying to refine the machinery of the brain. So whatever, whatever the challenges are in something like music listening or music performance, music production, those abilities are neurologically sharper. They're more just going to be more fluent, more efficient, more effective. You should learn faster. And you're also changing the machinery of the brain that supports fast change. So it's that's really good for you. But but for guys sakes, uh, get back if you if you're not engaged in it to a life in which you uh, at least make music with your voice if you can. And uh, but but try to make music when you can don't miss pass up an opportunity for that and and take listen music listening seriously. And, uh, and 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 really and get really listen again. Not just to music, but just listen. Listen to the birds. Listen to everything. Use your senses and engage in the world, and your brain will thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. And with that, happy brain training. Bye-bye, folks.